Welcome back to the Cube here in the Palo Alto studio. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube, with Dave Vellante, my co-host at the Silicon Valley AI infrastructure leaders here, part of the Cube and the NYSE Wired community. Dave Lorovsky Dave is here, CEO and co-founder of Celestial AI. Dave, great to see you. Thanks for coming into the studio. Thanks for having us. It's a long day. We're going to end the day here with this and hit the dinner community event, but thanks for coming in. Appreciate you. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. So let's get into, you guys are doing some really interesting stuff around what's going to make this clustered systems scalable, reliable, energy efficient. There's a lot of new packaging going on, not around chips, but like the systems. Yeah. So let's get into it. Before we start, give some context, what you guys do. Take a minute to explain the company, why it was founded, and what you guys are building. Yeah, so uh, Celestial AI is the creator of the Photonic Fabric, which is the optical interconnectivity technology platform for accelerated computing. So said another way, we're just, we're connecting AI accelerators with light, with photonics. So a lot of, lot of photonics and optical, these connectors are huge and hugely important because it's high interconnect, high bandwidth interconnect. Exactly, so yeah, high and bandwidth, low latency, low power interconnectivity. So there's a trend towards the packaging as you see chiplets getting, things are getting stacked on each other. So you're starting to see bigger chips actually with a lot of chips within it with optical connectors and everything's inside. So there's a lot of engineering going on to the packaging. And there's also a trend towards better connections and lower numbers of them. Is that, how do you see that? Is that that's a good thing or is that innovation? What's the status of the whole packaging under the covers? Yeah, so you know, there's two drivers for the package getting bigger. It's uh, an increase in the compute horsepower per package, um, but also in increasingly so, it's, uh, there's a need for more and more high bandwidth memory um, across systems, not just within the package, but across AI uh, acceleration systems. And that's, that's really being driven by the artificial intelligence workloads that are growing exponentially, right? So the, the models are growing um, to terabytes and tens of, uh, tens of terabytes of parameters. So we need memory capacity to keep pace with that. So you started the company in 2020, correct? That's right. And so what was informing you at that time? to say, we want to get into this hairy market and take on you know, the likes of Broadcom, Cisco, Intel, and a bunch of other companies that you know, many people probably haven't heard of that are sort of trying to disrupt things. What did you see then? And then how has that changed since the world went crazy in AI? Yeah, so and with artificial intelligence workloads, you know, like what you saw with Google that created the TPU beginning in 2015 mm -hmm. and put it into production in, in 2016, uh, tailoring infrastructure to meet specifically the AI workload requirements is something that drives a level of efficiency, both economic efficiency, performance advantages, and energy efficiency that uh, that a conventional processor, certainly CPUs, uh, cannot address. To be clear, what we're not doing is uh, competing with uh, NVIDIA and AMD and right. the hyperscalers. Sure. We have a technology platform that we're making available to them to improve uh, the performance of their systems, to improve uh, the uh, interconnectivity bandwidth, the resulting performance, latency, and power consumption. A development environment, you said. You said you're providing what to them? We're, we're providing a technology platform. Oh, technology AI. platform, okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what are some of the configuration optimizations for AI systems that you see for these workloads? Because more GPUs are being connected together. Yeah. What are some of the advancements? What are the, what are the key things? Is it parallel processing? What are some of the key areas to optimize these AI clusters? Yeah, so I think you can see in, for example, NVIDIA's roadmap, moving from a DGX box that has you know, uh, eight GPUs interconnected within mm -hmm. a server to you know, the, the more recent uh, Grace Blackwell systems <laughs> that are 72 GPUs that are, that are interconnected. You look at some of the hyperscale uh, data center uh, companies that are out there. So our customers include the, the, the big four, um, are, are uh, you know, the, that's where four companies, what's just interesting about this market, four companies represent 70% of what's growing to be roughly a trillion dollar market, right? So <laughs> big four being the hyperscalers. The big four hyperscalers. The other yeah. overseas yeah. of the country. Well, I mean, yeah. the big four Alibaba. that are located just, just Meta here. Is oh, yeah. fourth. Meta. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, you know. We saw this, that yesterday. Yeah, these, these companies have uh, AI compute clusters that are growing to tens of thousands of units. So. 15,000 uh, units, 24,000 uh, accelerators, all interconnected together. So what the photonic fabric enables is not just an increase in the energy efficiency and the, and the performance associated with, com with compute to compute fabric interconnectivity, but because we have a technology platform that enables uh, bandwidth 
that uh, is equivalent to or superior to HBM3 or HBM4, we, can, we have the ability to disaggregate memory. So um, we have two types of, two classifications of customers, those that are looking for uh, compute to compute or processor to processor interconnectivity in the near term, and those that are looking for the ability to mm -hmm. decouple high capacity, high bandwidth memory scaling from compute. And the photonic fabric enables that with, uh, enables it with optically interconnected uh, HBM. And the advantage of that the being, yeah, the being, advantage is mul multiple, fa multiple facets of the advantage. So let's break it down, right? So um, the first is CapEx, the upfront cost. Today, if you have a 10 trillion parameter model, like you know, some of the big hyperscalers do for recommendation engines, you need to shard that model or s partition it yeah. over hundreds or thousands of processors, even to run inference. So it's, it's, a, it's a large number of processors. And they're, so in order to scale the infrastructure to support that, just to house yeah. the a 10 trillion parameters, what they're doing is in large part, they're buying NVIDIA DGX boxes, for example, uh, uh, as of last year. Um, and uh, in, in large part, many of those NVIDIA boxes they're buying are not because they need incremental flops. They're buying it because they need the memory capacity. Yeah. So you know, it turns out that the memory cost, the cost per gigabyte of memory capacity for a current generation of a GPU um, is on the order of about $480 per gigabyte of memory, Damn. right? So by, by... Kills the bottlenecks. Yeah, well, by eliminating the use of uh, GPU as the world's most expensive memory controller, if you don't need the flops <laughs> and you're just buying, you're just buying GPUs for memory capacity, there's a, there's a more efficient way to do it. Using this. a piece of gold right. as a doorstop. Yeah, I mean, so, so we, can, we can reduce that cost uh, from about 480 bucks to uh, closer to less than 20. So the memory disaggregation is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, He's separating the, the memory from the GPU compute, if I yeah. can call it that, right? Whatever, All compute. GPU power, right? And then, and then you then then you scale that yeah. to uh, they. I mean, these guys do want to get to I don't know, a million GPU clusters yeah. because they're going to make so much money, you know, targeting advertising. Um, and you're an enabler of that. Yeah, that's that's right. And it, it's look using photons for moving information versus moving information over copper. It it you just we're we're leveraging the laws of physics to improve efficiency, right? So it's not just more capital efficient on the front end yeah. because. 40 to 70 70 percent of total power consumption in these hyperscale data centers is actually data transmission. It's the, it's the movement of data, not the yeah. computing of data. So if you can do that more efficiently, and in our case we can do it about 10 times more efficiently than moving information over copper, you can have a huge impact on the the total power requirements. You get more performance uh, within a given power envelope in a, in a data center campus, yeah. and that has a direct impact also on OPEX. It's funny on the copper. I mean, copper's back. I mean, there's efficiency there. Ethernet, copper, in the substrate, you're seeing that, you're seeing high bandwidth memory. I mean, what you guys are doing is interesting. The bottlenecks, you solve a bottleneck problem, but just in terms of like the power efficiency and scale, you, and all these GPUs are using high bandwidth memory around them. Yeah. You take that off. Is that what is that what I'm seeing? That's the, so it's that, you know, that's, am so I there, there, there are, It's another layer in the memory hierarchy, right? So there'll be still uh, memory on package, right? Okay. Um, but instead of having to go through what's called a a remote direct memory access, um, which is either via NVLink, it's Got it, it's yeah. a direct chip to chip, or if you if you're a uh, not using NVLink and you use a, a different uh, leaf and spline based architecture, Rocky, yep. which is uh, RDMA over converged Ethernet is the alternative. The it, problem there is you, that, that operation- well, It's external. It's, you know, it's high latency and these, these operations or these applications in recommendation engines yep. and in generative AI, latency translates directly to- And that's why everyone's charting everything like that. That's right. Yeah, yep. got it, yep. I got it. Finish yep. that thought. Latency yeah. tra translates, translates directly, directly, directly to revenue. Translates directly to revenue. So you have a latency implication, you have a, an energy implication yep. because the cost of moving information over Rocky or over NVLink is over 10 times uh, higher power than leveraging the photonic fabric for a direct memory access. And then the, the, I mean the, 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 the incremental benefit is performance, right? So. Uh, think about it, sharding uh, the models over large numbers of, even if it's yeah. only 250 sure. accelerators, you have the process of resynchronization of those memory transactions at, at the end of that, uh, yeah. of that operation. And for some large scale uh, uh, workloads like recommendation engines that our data center customers have, we can improve performance as well up to 12 and a half times. 
uh, relative to using a conventional DGX. That's glasses. why they're getting, that's why the packages are getting a little bigger because they want to they don't want to go external on the interconnects. Right, and we've seen the sharding problem for years in yeah. database. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, this is like an area that I've known about, but now it's so mainstream. Well, man, well in our world, mainstream. The high-speed interconnect architecture is a huge deal. Yeah. And if you got the big clusters, you'd have a multiple spines, a lot of leaves. Yeah. So you want to stay within that latency defines everything on the packaging, right? Yeah. That's the key key architectural piece. If I'm designing clusters? Yeah, well, so it, I mean there's there's the within package and then there's the package to package interconnectivity. We we do both. So um, Understanding that, again, the, the scale of the size of these models today is orders of magnitude, 100 yeah. to 1,000 times larger than what you could possibly fit in terms of parameter count on a package, right? So that it, it, no matter how big you make the package, it's yeah. an exercise in futility to try to keep up with yeah. the size of these models. So it's driving a need, right, for, again, for hundreds of thousands of, of, of these systems to be interconnected together. What is emerging yeah. is a new layer in the network, which is called optical compute interconnect, right? Um, which is complementary, yeah, yeah. um, not competitive with Ethernet, right? So Ethernet provides top of rack interconnectivity, lower cost. Yeah, it's more host uh, yeah. uh, 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 in yeah, interconnect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what we're creating is a, a an alternative to Rocky, um, which is a direct uh, processor to processor interconnectivity. Think about it like in VLink over yeah. fiber, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Got it. So you guys, um, who doesn't love silicon photonics, Dave? Um, <laughs> okay, first of all, a lot of action going on. The result of this, the net disruptive enabler is that you got faster stuff happening, processing more, more efficiency. You have to buy the God boxes, so to speak, to run inference. You can be more efficient. I call it God boxes, we referenced yeah. it earlier. And so is that the main difference? And then where are you on the product evaluation? You guys don't have yet shipping products, but you're all working with the big four. Well, how's that going? Can you give us any update on, yeah, on, so the, on that? We, yeah, we've, um, uh, the, the company's about four and a half years old. Um, we have validated the full uh, technology platform uh, at this point. So the, uh, we've, we validated the silicon photonics. We're using TSMC, um, uh, yeah. our, uh, basically four, A leader. Uh, four and five nanometer CMOS for yeah. our control electronics. Um, and we validated the full system and package and the optical interconnectivity. So you're ready to go. So yeah. Very advanced process. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's advanced process, but that's the beauty of our system architecture is that we can use really mm -hmm. the best of electronics um, in, in terms of state-of-the-art technology there, and we're using the photonics for what it's good for, which is moving information. And we're not limited, for example, to an integrated monolithic uh, control electronics in our silica photonics, right? Some companies have, they're using integrated monolithic um, drivers and trans impedance amplifiers uh, right inside their silicon photonics, and that, that limits them to about 45 nanometers, which is technology that's like 13 years old. Yeah, it's, it's kind of sore. So yeah. what's the progression yeah. now on the progress? Validation, you got customers. Yeah. Are you going to yeah. put the gas down and, and, and go to market? Yeah, so what we're in the middle of right now is uh, engaging, so one of the unique things about this, this company is our business model, right? So we're engaging in what we call collaborative development programs with our partners. I mean, the nice thing about having a relatively concentrated customer base like yeah. this is that you can, Design it. You can basically tailor solutions yeah. to meet exactly what they want. So and it's in, in the market. That's right. I mean, in <laughs> large part, better mousetrap wins everything. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so when when they ask us for something, the answer is yes. Right. Yeah. And their uh, design uh, partner. Uh, yeah. in, <laughs> There's in four of them. Yeah. In terms of the, <laughs> yeah. So we're we're really flexible in terms of the um, uh, the the, uh, the the implementation of our technology yeah. to meet their both. Uh, uh, package level, system level, application requirements, as well as their network uh, topology. Well, I mean, if I was, a, I mean, I mean, everything starts off as monolithic, and you're going to have the big four. But if you look at the enterprise market right now, as they start to realize my data center isn't my rack and stack old school networking yeah. kind of thing, yeah. they'll turn into supercomputer clusters. Yeah, that's and right. They're going to have a facility. They'll still do cloud. They'll work with other clouds. So I think the bigger guys like Meta could be a tell sign, reference architecture for how to do it on a smaller scale. Yeah. You'll still need to move stuff around. That, that, that's right, yeah. I mean, so for us, you know, we have to prioritize yeah. where we're allocating oh, yeah, resources course, yeah. Knock to try down. to maximize the return on, oh, yeah. on you our You have to win the investment. four. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but to address your question, we're, uh, we engage in these collaborative development programs, which typically take about 18 months um, to design our technology into our customers' AI accelerators. And all of those big four are, are building their own accelerators. Dave, it's great, great collaboration with the big guys. I have to ask you, what's the coolest thing that's happened in, in this collaboration with the, with the partners? 
or the biggest breakthrough that you're most excited about? I mean, the, the scale, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, the, the, the magnitude of the scale of a single socket win is, is immense. And it's, you know, what, what's beautiful about it is that it's, it, it has a huge impact on their bottom line, yeah. improving performance, reducing their capex, reducing the opex, including uh, yeah. the, the power consumption requirements, reducing rack yeah. space requirements. So it's, we're delivering immense valuable to, uh, value to them. Uh, but the the magnitude for uh, I've never seen anything like the size yeah. of the market opportunity for each individual uh, customer that we're engaged and with. And what's really nice. cool is that it, you know I'm, you know when you're out for 15 years doing the cube, you see good things happen. When Open Compute started, it was Facebook and Microsoft really donating a lot of IP. Yeah. When I asked Facebook why now Matt why they were doing it, you know what the number one answer from Zuckerberg and the team was? We want to hire people. We can't hire enough people. So let's if we give it away for free. Yeah. You get people working. That's open compute. Yeah. Again, that started again. That open source. That is kind of creating a community. And so I have to ask you the whole skills gap problem because a lot of engineers are looking at kernel coding. Yeah. A lot. There's a big gap there. So you're seeing all the app guys coming and say, "Hey, if I get down closer to the physical, yeah. I'm going to win." Now you got a resurgence in hardware. Yeah. So what do you see the 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 talent pool out there? What's the forecast? What's your view on? You know, is how big is the gap? Is it closing? Are people interested? What are some of the cool things that, if people are watching that want to work for you or in semis or any chips, what's the big, you know, enticing projects, the problems to work on? Yeah, I mean, what's uh, I think what's drawing a lot of people to the company is that we are the company um, that is bringing light to computing uh, in, a, in an entirely different way, truly integrating light um, and the ability to deliver data photonically directly to the point of consumption within a chip, which uh, to, you know, uh, to date, no one has yet been able yeah. to do. Uh, the technology platform is really the product of um, uh, uh, Phil Winterbottom, who's the architect, he's our CTO and the architect of our, of our, of our photonic fabric technology platform. But it is a multifaceted, multidisciplinary yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, system, which requires expertise on the digital ASIC side for yeah. CMOS, it requires expertise in, in large part in analog mixed signal, which is really the, the most complex area, mm -hmm. uh, which drives uh, the control electronics um, for our silicon photonics. You know, we, you know, we've, we've tailored and developed our own state-of-the-art CERDES, which is uh, specific to this electrical, optical, electrical yeah. link. There's a huge amount of uh, innovation taking place also in the packaging. Um, which uh, we've, we've yeah. built a world-class team uh, there as well, and then the software stack, right? So yeah. uh, we're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for our customers to adopt the technology. We just had Charlie Giancarlo on from Pure Storage. He was at Cisco back in the early days. He's been a legend. But back it was simpler, but it was basic. Now it's harder, networking and storage. Yeah. Same with photonics. You know, they say, oh, it's connected from point A to point B. I'm oversimplifying yeah. it. But yeah. now you got to know chips, <clears throat> photonics, light. And yeah. so the cross-disciplinary impact to build this is different. What's, and how do you feel about that? Can you share kind of the scope of the ability to have that cross-discipline view? I think that's exactly where the innovation lies, right? Which is having a team that looks holistically at building the full stack. And that's one of the huge differentiators of this company, which is, you know, again, we're building not just the silicon photonics component of it, um, but we have mm -hmm. expertise in the control electronics, the Serdes, the network convergence layer to ensure yeah. protocol compatibility uh, for you know, whether it's memory transactions that we're running or you know, running streaming Axie uh, over, the, over the fabric for chip yeah. to chip compute yeah. interconnectivity, um, the packaging and, and having the ability to partner with customers and answer the, again the question yes as to yeah. uh, you know, can, you, can you integrate the photonic fabric into their systems and package. One of the innovations that we've done on the packaging front is a technology that we call OMIB, which is an optical multi-chip interconnect bridge. So it provides you know, if you're familiar with COSL at TSMC, or if you're familiar with EMIB at Intel, which is okay. a bridge technology yeah. that enables these yeah. larger packages um, within a, a multi-chip module, our technology delivers exactly that same functionality electronically to provide not just the electronic interconnectivity, but we can deliver uh, optical interconnectivity in addition to that. So it's a it's extraordinarily powerful in terms of yeah. an architectural. A tool in in a in a system toolbox. And you guys have raised 370 million. Is that correct? Yeah, 340 million. 340. Today, yeah. and, and how many are you? Uh, we're about 125 currently. Yeah, yeah, growing about okay. 50, we'll grow about 50 percent uh, so, uh, this year. Uh, uh, and <coughs> where are you at in terms of capital raises? Are you in the process of we're, more? Or we're done. I mean, yeah. you are done. Yeah, we're okay. done. Then. Yeah. So that, that's I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's not really a lot of money. 
Yeah, we're we're pretty capital efficient. Capital so efficient we, business? Yeah. yeah, we raised 175 million dollars Series C right. um, this year, and I think you know we've w one of the objectives is getting to revenue as quickly as possible. Um, and the, get so the, design, the, the get design money coming in. That's right. So yeah, the the beautiful thing is the near term revenue is yeah. customers putting skin in the game, right, to work with us to get our technology designed into their parts that they'll, you know, they're running hundreds you know, of thousands of units of course. Awesome. Dave and I always yeah. talk about this, and what you're doing, by the way, is phenomenal. It's the old school Silicon Valley playbook. A lot of, the, in the ZERP era, no one really understood this, but professional services is a great way to get customer design partners to get paid yeah. and to bootstrap the product market fit while saving cash. But it's also you know, it's a like, filter, right? <laughs> it's, it's, getting, it's, a, it's a filter for what I call rabbit chasing, right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, if a customer is willing to put tens of millions of dollars into an engagement with us to yeah. qualify the technology, you know they're serious, yeah. right? So we're not just on a rabbit chasing. Exercise. Versus yeah. some people, oh, don't get distracted. Professional services doesn't scale. Yeah. No, 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 it's rocket boosters. It's yeah. going to get it up to orbit. And it's a means to yeah. an end, right? We're yeah. not doing uh, the, you know, R&D services for the sake yeah. of- It's design building. You're using the customers. We're working our technology into parts that, that are running hundreds of thousands yeah. of units a quarter. Yeah, it's part of your product strategy. Yeah, right. That's right. Well, congratulations. Thanks for coming on. Again, confirming and this day that in the community, infrastructure's hot, engineering's happening, there's a talent, talents out there can work on hard problems. Innovation. So don't ever say that there's not enough hard problems to work on in, yeah. in tech. <laughs> there's plenty of that. <laughs> yeah. All right, Dave, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks. thanks for finishing off the day to wrap us up here in Palo Alto. Yeah. You're watching theCUBE here in the Palo Alto series for the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Day, part of theCUBE and NYSE Wired. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, thanks for watching. <laughs>